Whether it's bad planning, bad luck, bad timing, or bad inventions, well-intentioned bad decisions have plagued history for thousands of years. Welcome to Historic Hindsight. Hello and welcome to another episode of Historic Hindsight. I'm John, that's Tom, and today we're going to talk to you about the Ford Pinto. That's right, Johnny, the Ford Pinto. This is our first non-Civil War related thing in a while, and I do need to correct you on my name. Uh, I didn't bring it up beforehand because it was Civil War episodes and I was a lieutenant then, so it was oh, okay. But uh, right. I am I am Lord Thomas uh, Marsh now. Oh, uh, oh, from, I'm from Christmas. I'm yes, sorry. My wife, my wife got me a lordship title. So. I did not mean to disrespect uh, your lordship title. I'm sorry. I'm John. <laughs> okay, so, uh, that's uh, Lord, Lord Thomas J. Marsh. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, uh, so all you peasants bow down. And we're talking about a, a Ford. Why are we talking about the Ford Pinto? A Ford Pinto. I well, mean, they're a crummy you, car, right? Cars, it was it was like one of those yeah, old were, crap cars. Yeah, they were one of those crummy cars, subcompacts that were created in the '70s to compete with the VW Bug, and it had okay. a particularly bad reputation of perhaps yeah maybe catching on fire. Not, oh, if you touch the back end too hard. So not just breaking down, just they would no, light on fire they, and ex- they would light on fire and, and then explode, explode, presumably, because it's or at a least, car. Or at least that's the rumor. That's the uh, that's the that's the reputation they have. So we're going to explore the exploding okay. Ford Pinto reputation. Uh, but before we get into the reputation, let me be a salesman real quick to tell you a little bit about the Ford Pinto because I know most yeah, of you listen if I, at home. If I was in the market for a new car. Uh, and I'm looking for. I assume this. I this was a small car. This was like a like a Civic Del Sol, like very hat or a, or maybe a hatchback, like it's an a early hatchback, days yeah. Honda it's, Civic. It's a, it's a sub. Yeah, yeah. It's a subcompact. Okay. Pre, I think it's actually a pre pre Honda Civic, maybe. But I, I don't. Oh, know. probably. I don't, I don't think those cars. came out to like the 80s or 90s. It is, who knows? It is one of the first uh, American subcompacts. Okay. Okay. It was produced from 1970 to 1980. 71, depending on where you want to look at the year calendar date stuff, 1971 to 1980, was the okay. smallest car Ford offered since 1907. So they had this reputation going bigger, 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 bigger. And now they're like, wow, right. time to go smaller. This yeah, subcompact sudden, Suddenly class. there's a market for, for a small car that mm-hmm. um, I guess if it, this was a hatchback. And so – Well, it, it is it is offered in – uh, several different configurations. You can get it as a two-door sedan, a two-door sedan deliver, which I have no idea what the hell that one was, a two-door station wagon, which is an ugly, <laughs> two-door ugly station. Looking, yeah, an the point ugly of a station car. wagon is to like maximize capacity for. Yeah, like have like. Why would you have as yeah th- third row seating? Yeah, no, nope, this one's. Yeah, a it's like station it's like wagon. having a van, but if you wanted to have a car, like it's but it, it's like the yeah. the pre SUV type. Uh, or vehicle. what most people most people are familiar with the uh, the three door hatchback, aka yeah. the runabout. Okay, yeah, that's the one that I was thinking that's of. The, that, yeah, that's the yeah, one that's that the... it, it's uh, they 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 found a market for uh, people who had small families but needed to put groceries in their cars. Still, I guess. Yes. Yes. Uh, and uh, and if, if if you didn't like the Ford badge and you are a Mercury fan, oh. uh, it was offered as the Mercury Bobcat because well in America. Our automotive industry thinks that you need the exact same car with different badges depending on which company you buy from, even though they're all owned from the same conglomerate of corporations. So it was offered in as a four-speed manual or a three-speed Ooh. automatic and either a four-cylinder or six-cylinder engine. The Ford Pinto was designed to be a cheap, lightweight vehicle that was cheap to buy, cheap to fill up, and cheap to maintain. No expense was spared, except maybe that whole safety thing. Well, I mean that's fantastic, though. That I, I, so, how how much horsepower is this thing packing? I did I didn't look that up. Oh, like ten. Sh- Gemini Christmas. <laughs> I don't know. How are it you gonna not look? We're gonna have a we're gonna have an well, episode about a car, and you're not gonna look up. Uh, you look up the well. I'm not a car guy. You look up the horsepower. While I keep talking. Uh, but who needs safety when you can have the Pinto that can fit two sets of golf clubs in the hatchback? Weighing only 2,015 pounds and costing a whopping Johnny $2,065, brand new, in 1971. Not sold on the Ford Pinto? Well, just hear from the Ford advertisers. 
Announcing the new Pinto three-door runabout. Pure Pinto, front to back. With an extra surprise, bringing up the rear. Up goes the third door, and the new Pinto runabout packs more fun than any little import. It's the little car with the five-foot trunk. The Pinto three-door runabout. The third door makes packing simple and easy. Deep pile carpeting is standard in the front and rear area. And with the rear seat up, there's room for four. New Pinto three-door runabout. Easy to pack, easy to pay for. And Pinto is built to go and go and go. See the new Pinto three-door runabout at your Ford dealer. Packs more fun than any little import. Pinto, the little carefree car from Ford. Okay, so it's about 75-ish horsepower. It was anywhere from like 50 to, a, to, to 100, but that seems, that's good. That's, that's pretty good. And, and if you weren't paying attention, the, the commercial did uh, advertise the special surprise in the rear. Uh, they yeah, also the, had radio. Which was, I assume they were talking about the storage space. Yeah, they were talking like, about look, all, space. That, all that space that you can put in the and, and absolutely nothing else. And they also in in radio spots. This this would be pulled later. Had uh, had advertisements mentioning the warm feeling that a Ford Pinto gives its owner. So, um, <laughs> I mean, they why was that pulled? They were. I want to. <laughs> <laughs> like, I want to say they knew what was going on the whole time and were like <laughs> making a joke. And then they're like, oh, I guess we can't really do that anymore, guys. Yeah, it's just they're just some sick guys being like, all right, well, they're all catching on fire. They're going to kill lots of people. Let's, let's go with a warm feeling joke and, and see, how that, see how long we can get away with it. Some intern got fired for that joke, I'm sure. I'm sure. And so you might be wondering yourself, well, Ford Pinto sounds pretty awesome. Where can I go and get Not one? Bad. Why yeah. did they stop? Yeah, why did they stop manufacturing them in the 1980s? And full disclosure, my dad had a Ford Pinto, my brother had a Ford Pinto. I drove around in the Ford Pinto like all through the 90s. Because uh, my family was poor, we didn't have like we never bought anything new, so it was always secondhand. Yeah, but you're like, still here. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we and I'm still so, here. We okay, have Ford so Pintos, why we... and I have, I have fond memories. There are some features that they don't tell you in the advertisement. Uh, at least with my dad's Ford Pinto, you didn't need a key to turn the car on. You could just turn the ignition on without the key in it. Although I mean, you ha- did need that key, feature. you did need that key to fill up because the gas tank was locked. So, uh, well, you could, so if your Ford could Pinto, drive the car, that's fine. If your Ford you Pinto gets stolen, they're not going further than it's like a three hundred like and twenty mile miles. Yeah. yeah, I don't know how yeah, big yeah, the gas could. tank was, but. <laughs> My goodness. I mean, that's not bad. What? I mean, okay, and yeah. I, I assume this was a cheap car. This was something that was affordable for lots mm-hmm. of people. So, mm-hmm. okay, so uh, aside from the small um, sometimes catching on fire when you get rear-ended, why would I – What could possibly Why are we doing this yeah, episode? Right. Why do I well, it, well, care? Well, because well, – okay, so bear with me here. So the development. The whole Ford Pinto already starts off on a bad foot with its development. So starting around 1967, Ford was debating about getting into the small market or the small car market Mm -hmm. uh, that was currently being dominated by the Volkswagen Bug or Hitler's People's Car Ah, that came to the United States and everybody was loving. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a Volkswagen. They're good. We love it. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah. Uh, And so then President Seaman Bunky Nudson is his name. Bunky is the nickname, so, you know, all right, okay. we'll call him uh, Bunky. And real quick, this is president of the company, not president of the United States. Yeah, he was a okay, president I of the company of Ford at this time. I didn't think he the wanted... American people would elect somebody by that name, but you, you just, I don't yeah. know all the presidents, so you never know. He uh, he wanted nothing to do with the small car market. He says, why, why? We're making hand over fist with a Mustang, larger right. sedans, and trucks. Why, why do I... Can't, like there's no profit margin on that. Why would I want that? Yeah. So what's the, basically so, what's what's the what's the value to the company of yeah. producing a car that is super cheap and costs you know makes you next to nothing. Yep. But a young up and comer, Lee Lacoco, uh, I think I'm pronouncing this right. It's L A C O C C A Lacoco, Lacoca. Hey. Anyways, he argued forcibly that. Something. Yeah, maybe Lee Lacoca. Hey, Lacoca. Yeah, Lacoca. He argued forcibly that if Ford didn't compete with the VW bug, then the Germans and Japanese would take the market. And oh, okay, so who cares? So they would take the market Let that them. they don't want and don't care about. And they would take the market that they already control, anyways. So they're not taking anything. Okay. They're just continuing to control the market that Ford has not bothered getting into. 
Yeah. And the problem is this market, the subcompact, is very cutthroat. You're talking about dollars and cents meaning everything. A $20 margin could make or break your car. If your car costs $2,020, yeah. it could price you right out of the market because people who were looking at the small subcompact were young adults getting their first vehicle. Yep. Yeah. Uh, young families getting their first vehicle, people who need it as cheap as they can get. Yeah, parents buying their kid a first car, and they're like, I'll buy you a car, but it's going to be like a Ford Pinto. Bottom of the barrel <laughs> car. Like it's going to be entry level type stuff. I think the equivalent today would be the Panda. Oh, uh, the, that's like, it's is like that a in Kia? Europe. It's very, I, I think it's the Kia. Oh, no. It's a Kia or a Ford, one of the two, and it's dirt, dirt cheap crap car it, it might it might be one of the european brands too but it, yeah it, 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 but, yeah uh, or like um um uh, not, i guess not a smart car because those are kind of pricey aren't they no those are kind of pricey yeah uh but lococo he was gonna lococa he's gonna win his argument and bunky would resign and lococo would take over me, uh, as president and immediately begin production of the ford pinto he wanted the model ready for the model year 1971 which gave them a whopping 25 months to complete so you had to get the car from design to production in 25 months. And you might think that that sounds like a long time, but the industry standard was 43 months. I was going to say, no, that, well, so, first of all, because I've worked in, in, in a, a scientific manufacturing area, yeah. which manufactured test strips for diabetes. Uh, yeah, that's not a long time at all to go no. from, from ground zero to finished product. That's, that's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> And to make matters worse, or to drive that home point or that point home faster, is uh, that it's the uh, it's the record for the fastest car from concept to production up to that point. So, um, even oh my, I thought they went like super quick on some of the early like Model A or Model T or something. I think they went like pretty quick on some of those. Those well, I, this is up but to this, this point is, the fastest concept that's... from from idea on paper to full production car. Little, actually, it's even wild. a little less than 25 months. Uh, the problem here with this whole thing, if it's, again, if you're not understanding why that's a problem, it takes 18 months to build up an industrial line to produce cars. All the tooling that it takes to right. stamp out the metal, to make the car, it takes 18 months to do that. So, yeah, that's the thing a lot of people. Done. That's a lot of thing. Uh, one of the things that people don't consider is not only. Uh, do you have to get the design, get everything, figure out where to put together? You have to build the machinery to cut the to pieces to the right size, to put them together the right way. You have to – like it's a lot that goes into it. And normally that's the absolute last thing that's done. Normally your last 18 months are – Building the tooling for the manufacturing. Because right. at that yeah, point, you have, every, you have, you have a prototype car. You know what? Yeah. You've tested said car a couple of times and, yep. and you're just going into full production. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, been hand built, hand cut, and everything else. And now, now you want yeah. to mass produce. So you build the machinery to mass produce it. Yeah. The Pinto didn't have that option. It was being, the tooling was being built as the car was being designed. And so if like, we got an the engineer, door designed. Okay. So an engineer so instance, finds that his cut was off just a little bit or whatever. He had to make some sort of adjustment. They have to now adjust an entire machine's calibration to make those yeah. corrections. Or if you find that the placement of your gas tank might have been not in the right spot, sorry about you. So where was it's, the gas tank? What did it... Well, <laughs> so <laughs> to get... <laughs> How do you put a gas tank in a wrong spot? What do you... Well, okay, so to make matters worse about the like the development of this, Lacoca wanted uh, it to be as roomy in the inside as possible, you know, a family car that could seat of five course. or yeah. carry two loads of golf clubs, and he wanted a very stringent, it had to be no less than, or no more than 2,000 pounds and no more than $2,000, which from the original production that I told you earlier, they didn't meet. It was 2,015 pounds and 2,065 I was going to say, that sounds like some marketing ploy BS that the marketing department comes up with. They're like, all right, now you engineers and everything have to come up and fit our specs yeah. and, and and meet this. And that's – but only so they could say 2,000 pounds for $2,000 or some Dollars, yeah. crap like that. Some dumb thing like that, yeah. Well, and so that leaves us to the gas tank that I was telling you about. You know, like maybe you mis misplaced the gas tank. So the first initial idea was to use Ford's new saddle-type gas tank that they had the patent for, which mm -hmm. uh, actually had the gas tank sitting over the, real, the rear axle, the rear differential. Okay. So it was away from the rear bumper. It was sitting on top of the rear differential. So the only way that that could really get broken or hit would be 
I'm pretty if that bad snaps axle. and yeah, like basically yeah. if your car I mean, gets crushed between two and your axle snaps in half, then yeah. the so gas tank is going to be in danger. The problem with the the new saddle type gas tank is that um, it makes the whole floor of the car sit up higher, which mm -hmm. means uh, yeah. now you can't get the two sets of golf clubs. You can only get one set of golf clubs. And Lokoka said, no, two mm -hmm. sets of golf clubs. Because you're gonna want to bring your buddy to the golf course, so and, and, and instead clubs. of and instead of being like, okay, well, maybe we just make it a little bit taller. Nope. Uh, can't do that. They they did what exactly? Uh, they decided to put the gas tank, and, and to be fair to Ford, at the industry standard for subcompacts, which was behind the rear differential and in front of the rear bumper. So, in the middle of the two, and, and in the Ford under Pinto's the case, trunk. Yeah, under the trunk, and in the Ford Pinto's case, that meant six inches in front of the rear bumper. When you look at a picture of a Ford Pinto from behind, you can see the gas tank, the big silver thing that's up underneath the car. Yeah, that's your gas tank. So I had an experience once where I was driving to work, and um, I was in a Honda Civic, and all the traffic was coming to a stop and so i started coming to a stop and then the van behind me went off onto the shoulder and i looked in the rearview mirror to figure out why all of a sudden this van was beside me and a semi truck was coming and he came and he smashed into the back of me i luckily i everything was fine he didn't hit my actual metal bumpers he like went over that to the bumper the plastic bumper and then the trunk uh completely folded my trunk in half um but if I were driving a Pinto, I'd be dead, right? Like, is that what you're saying? Ah. Uh. That would have exploded my gas tank. Because the bottom yeah. half of my car was folded in half. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so at the same time the Pinto's in development, there's some industry changes going on. In 1967, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, from now on I'm just going to say the NHTSA, uh, passed its <laughs> Which first is standard. Which less of a mouthful. Well, it's not, but it's better than the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Passed its first standard for automotive fuel system safety, known as Section 301. So, the very first safety-wide guidelines in the United States for yep. fuel was yeah. in 1967. That took a while. It took a minute. Uh, when, when did the, the the first Model T rolled off the lot in like 19, 18, 1890 something, something or 1903? Maybe something like 3? 19, it was early 1900s. Yeah. yeah. By the early 1900s, you had cars. Yeah. So we'll say 67 years Holy to God. come up with some kind of safety standards about fuel systems. To decide that hmm. maybe this highly flammable thing that we light on fire to operate this machinery uh, should have some sort of regu safety regulation to Regulations, monitor. yeah. yeah okay. Some crash test safety. And in this first 1967 proposal, it was just talking about front-end collisions. It wasn't talking about rear-end collisions. It was just talking about front-end collisions. So head. Ford was like, yeah, head on head. Ford's like, deal. Sure, we'll yeah, sign off on that. We, don't we care. can deal with it. <laughs> Who puts their fuel tank in the front anymore, suckers? What kind of maniac would do that? Which is crazy because, like, you think, okay, we're only worried about the front end. But if a, in a normal car crash, if the front end is getting hit, usually that front end is hitting something. And in your case, it's hitting the rear end, right? Because, well, you know, like, if you're in traffic, the front end is probably going to hit the rear end of something. So maybe be concerned about the rear end. Too. Yeah, I mean, this seems a little bit like the whole um, all those planes that came back in, in one of the wars with all the, the shots in them. And then yes, they're like, yeah, oh, yeah. we need to repair that. And it's like, no, you need to repair the thing, the ones that aren't surviving. Like, the head on head yeah. collisions are the worst ones. And so that's the ones they're most concerned about. But the one that happens way more frequently is he is head on rear, is, yeah. yeah, is a rear end, and now they're they're gonna ignore that because they're just gonna blow up, I guess. It took a couple of years, but in January 1969, 18 months into the Ford Pinto's production, or not production, but design process, the NHTSA considered adding rear end collisions into the standard. They ah, proposed that it needed can't have that. And Ford's like, ooh, well, hold, the Ford's hold, they're like, hold on a second, let's let's hear what they got to say, and, and the the standard was proposed that it needed to be able to sustain a twenty mile per hour moving barrier impact on the rear. So basically, you have okay, yeah, the the, the car's not fixed, the barrier's not fixed, they're both moving, so it's not a, a static accident, right? At twenty and, miles per hour. Well, and going back to when I got rear-ended by the the semi truck, I was able to slow down enough to where as he impacted me, I wasn't 
stopped and I wasn't slammed on the brake, I was able to get hit and then move forward it's a little a bit impact. and then hit my brakes yeah. again, which makes a gig- anybody who studies physics, that's a huge difference in, yep. in the total impact. And Ford was all on board. They said, yep, we're going to do that. We're good. We're good. Okay. Uh, but in August 1970, the NHTSA changed their mind and said it now has to be a 20-mile-per-hour fixed barrier impact. So oh. now you're basically driving that car in reverse at 20 miles an hour and hitting a fixed barrier. Right. And Ford's like, ooh. No, gi- no give. Yeah, we don't, we don't like that. So we're going to fight you over the next eight years on this very point. They said that they would voluntarily comply with a moving barrier 20 miles per hour by 1973 and get all their vehicles up to that standard by 1973 voluntarily because this isn't this isn't law yet. This is still right. being Okay, but, uh, but, but by all their vehicles, I would assume that the Pinto would be the one that they're concerned about and not the rest of them. Perhaps, yes. But, I mean, they they all have – I mean, the the safety standards of the 1970s so it, it, not, vehicle they was weren't there, about not apparently. Exist. Yeah, because the whole crash testing and it's, stuff, this was like – yeah, this is – It's this when is they started to develop it. Is that so why – like, be- wait, hold up. It, is the newness of safety standards the reason why crash te- – like the crash test dummies became a thing like the late 80s In the 90s? 90s? I, th- I because think so, Because that's I like when so, they yeah. finally did, like figured out a way to actually Or try to make it safe. Yeah. Uh, the safety I've, of vehicles. Yeah, I that's think – terrifying. I, think, honestly, I thought it was just be, because yeah. they'd been doing that for decades no, I think that honestly might be when it really picks up in industry standards, and like you're talking about the safety of cars. And, Holy and, uh, yeah. crap. Now, you might ask yourself, why was Ford like on board with the 20-mile-per-hour moving accident but not the 20-mile-per-hour 20, you know, 20 mile per hour fixed barrier? Like, Well, I would assume was, that they like, could pass you one would have and not to the know, other. Like, yeah, <laughs> like, <'cause, laughs> and that's the clear thing is Ford had to have known that there was a problem with at least one of their vehicles being able to pass that, so they were like, no, we don't want to do it. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a harder test to pass. I don't want to take it because I already know we're not going to pass it. Yeah. So uh, so that there's this short, pesky design table comes back to bite them in the butt because, again, the placement of the fuel tank. Um, now, Ford denies ever crash testing any Pinto prior to its production. Wait. They deny it. They in, in, Wait, in uh, later uh, trials. Hold, hold on. I'm sorry. When you say... When you say people deny things, they usually deny something that they would be accused of that's bad. They're denying yes. taking any sort of precautions to uh, figure out the safety of a vehicle. Why would they do that? Why would they do they're that? Trying to claim, they're trying to claim they had no knowledge that there was any kind of potential design flaw in their system. But, so they're saying prior to the prior to the first car being sold, they never, Johnny, they never crash tested the ford pinto however uh insiders would testify otherwise and there is some clear evidence that comes out in some trials that say yeah you definitely did now i so keep, so they did this, and then found bad results and then tried to hide it is yeah. what you're hinting yes. at so yes yeah so a lot of this information i'm about ready to give you there's a big caveat here so it's going to come from a 1970s uh, uh article from Mother Jones entitled okay. Pinto Madness, which has an expose into the Ford Pinto and all of Ford's cover ups of now, its known problems. I I vaguely have heard of Mother Jones. It's just a magazine company, like a kind of a it's like they do investigative like... yeah, it's like an investigative journalism that's like the companies are doing something evil, so they it's that kind of got they it's not gotcha journalism, but it's like No, if okay, so it's it's, the, it's like blow, legitimate Legitimate yeah. good journalism being done on things that people might be concerned about or need journalism. Yes. About. Okay, yeah. but it is. Yeah. It's not a Daily Mail. It's not. It, it, uh, these no, are legitimate I don't, I don't journalists. Think so. Yeah, I yeah I don't. At think least so. back then, like who knows what it's but turned into now? They they did. Yeah, I don't know if it even still exists or not. But they uh, they I've heard they of did it, exaggerate. So. They did exaggerate the death totals. So okay, so you can speculate about some of. You can't speculate about some of their stuff. And, of course, a lot of their sources do want to remain anonymous. So, again, read it yourself. I'll put the article, you know, in the in the description if you want to read it. Um, but grain of but, salt type stuff, but this is what we know. Yeah. 
or yeah. think we know. So we think we know. So according to them, Ford crash tested 40 Pintos pre-release, and every rear-end crash test over 40 miles per hour with an unmodified Pinto resulted in the ruptured fuel tank. Why, mm. you ask? Well, upon immediate impact, the tank would be ripped away from the pipe connecting the uh, the fuel spout. So the fuel spout... Right. Where you put the fuel in, uh, there's a there's a tube that goes down to the gas tank. Mm -hmm. Upon impact at anything over 25 miles per hour, the tank would separate from that. that spout, which then risks fuel being spread upon the ground of right off the bat from the initial impact. Well, but the good thing the is there's no part of the car that's metal that could cause a spark to ignite <laughs> that fuel, which is to nice. make matters. To make matters worse, the gas tank would be pushed into the rear differential where there are four bolts facing towards the gas tank that would puncture into the gas <laughs> tank and rupture it. <laughs> it's four needles. Four we, needles four facing needles. a balloon. <laughs> four steel needles facing a balloon that's made out of steel hitting each other, and now gas is spread everywhere. And so a highly some, flammable, combustible flammable. So now at this point, that's all fantastic. you need is a spark. All you need is a spark. In the age where all the vehicles are made out of steel, so it's steel rubbing on steel with four steel bolts rubbing on the freaking steel gas tank that yeah. you just ruptured, full of highly flammable gas. Well, so, um, and steel running on the, I mean, pieces falling off onto the ground, hitting the, the concrete. I'm sure everybody's seen a, you know, a moving truck or something that has the chain a little bit too long that is just dragging along the highway, just sparks, kicking up sparks, 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 sparks everywhere. Yep. Like, that's. Yep. Every bit of the car that fell off or whatever is is hitting that and, and causing a spark. And good God. Yeah. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, <clears throat> any any crash over forty five miles per hour, uh, this is this is the car yep. uh, would would accordion the car and Ooh, bend the yeah. frame upwards, mm -hmm. which had a bad tendency to jam the door shut. Yep. So yeah. So you can now get you're out. in a car that's doors are jammed that you can't get out of. And you've got gas leaking everywhere, so all it takes is one spark, and now you're and in a flaming coffin. <laughs> Good night. Uh, actually, that is what uh, ended up uh, totaling my car out. Uh, it wasn't the the folded over trunk. It was uh, they after it hit the trunk, it hit enough of the frame and bent it enough up to where they're like, and now it's it's yeah, total. Yeah, it. I mean, it wasn't yeah, bent can't. bad. Like like I could open my doors, everything was fine, but. Uh, Car safety's come a long way since the 70s, Car apparently. Car safety has come a long way since the 70s. <laughs> Thank goodness and if for the NHTPTCA. Yeah, and if all of that <laughs> wasn't, wasn't bad enough, um, the Ford's transmission was faulty in the Pinto, and it had a tendency to stall out the vehicle. So even if you got yourself a brand-new Ford Pinto, every now and then it would just stall out because yeah. the transmission would screw it up. Okay. Uh, and, and see, in my dad's Pinto and my brother's Pinto – uh, it, it was worse with automatics, uh, but in my dad's Pinto, it happened all the time, and I just assumed, like, it's just a shitty used vehicle. Like, as a kid, that's what I always assumed. That's eh, just right. a shitty used vehicle. Yeah, it, it, it's one of those vehicles that you buy with a check engine light on that has its issues that you got to kick in the right way to get going. Yeah. Something like that. Uh, little did I know. No, that was <laughs> that's just, <laughs> that's just, uh, just a, that's just a Ford Pinto. That's a design feature <laughs> that they in included. And, and, and do you think any of this was brought to Lococa's attention? The engineers, they said, hell no. Uh, he didn't want to hear about it. He said flat out he doesn't give a shit about safety. He isn't going to talk about safety. Anything at all that was brought to his attention that would delay the production of the Ford Pinto, he would pull out of the cigar, smoke on it a couple of times, throw the green book at him, which was the, uh, the manual for like the goals of the project, and say, read that and get back to work. Okay, so... He refused to. Uh, he just refused to listen about safety because he had yeah. all he wanted to do was to insert into the compact car uh, competition. Competition, and win. yes. He was interested yes. in winning uh, that competition at all costs. Uh, yes, which uh, meant cutting those... all the costs of uh, uh, testing Ever, for yeah, safety. Just whatever. And, Yep, yep. Cool. Uh, but one of those engineers was Lou Tubin, uh, who was so concerned with the problem that he asked his superior, his supervisor's boss, uh, if he could have a meeting set up with all the engineers and Lacoca uh, to discuss a more safer tank design that he had discovered in 1971. Pre-sale of the Pinto, before the Pinto's even in full production, he's already got the fix. And what he found out 
was that a simple one pound, one dollar piece of plastic in front of the gas tank, between the gas tank and the rear differential, between yep. those bolts, yeah. would, 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 would solve it. It would stop the gas tank from being punctured that that and, was enough and mitigate to, the risk of the whole rupture that's enough yeah. to absorb the impact hey. and and i thought you were gonna yeah. be like he, he wants the black box stuff from the uh no, airplanes no. or whatever what, to make oh, it a a just a a one pound one piece of plastic or one dollar piece of plastic that 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 was it one one dollar just put it in there but yeah. by this time the machines are built so it's not really just a one dollar piece of right. plastic. Well, that, and, that, and that's the thing nobody incorporate. No, that's the thing nobody ever, gotta, ever thinks about is when you change anything. It doesn't matter how cheap that that little piece is. The the labor, the parts that go into correcting the machinery, the recalibration of them, all of that is time and a whole mm-hmm. heck of a lot, a lot of money. Of money. I was told when I was and, working uh, at um, the 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 random place that I I used to work at. Um, that if there was something that I could, the way that I should think about costs and expenses and, and everything else is, um, basically value my time at $150 an hour because they estimated that's about what the company was paying me or paying for me to do my services. Now I wasn't getting getting anything near that but it's once the company calculated all their health benefits and their vacation and, and their just general productivity and everything else that's the number they came about and they're like if you can find a way to get that lower do it and sometimes that would involve spending thousands of dollars but they didn't care because it saved overall in the end yeah they didn't this would to add to the expense, <laughs> and they didn't want to do it because already at this point, the Ford Pinto's over that two thousand uh, dollar price tag, and it's already over that two thousand pound weight limit. So yeah, t- two thousand seventeen, two thousand sixty four, or whatever doesn't sound nearly as good. No, it doesn't sound nearly as good. So Lacoca, well, the supervisor said, "Yeah, sure, go ahead." Uh, uh, Build up your, uh, you know, build up your meeting, get it scheduled. So, you know, have, have at it. So the date was scheduled. The engineers were all invited. The production team was invited. Lacoca was invited. And when the day came, uh, Lou and his boss were the only two to show up. <laughs> Nobody cared. Now, if all of this is not bad enough up to this point, we have the infamous memo, the Pinto memo. Wait, this is the so, thing that... This is a thing. You this say that like thing. I should have heard of it. I've never heard of this. No. Well, I mean, if you lived in the 70s, you heard of it. Oh, okay. Uh, well, and if I you know about the Ford so. Pinto fiasco, you've heard of it. Okay. Now, there's a lot of misinformation about this. Now, I will say right off the bat, this isn't directly referencing the Ford Pinto. This is referencing all vehicles in Ford. Okay. okay. Yeah, right. Because so. this is I, – I'm guessing this is addressing their whole, like, collision – Yes. Uh, uh, lawsuit would not lawsuit, it's, but the, the yes regulation yeah, well, it's, it's the it's the fight against the nhtc tsa so in their fight against section 301 <laughs> on rear end collisions ford was in talks with the nhtsa uh-huh. and they said that they would do a cost benefit ratio to show the nhtsa that uh, this safety protocol would actually cost the industry more money than it would save and there's no point in doing it like the the risk is mitigated there's not enough benefit to fixing the problem because the mi- risk is so small. Anyways. Okay, wait. So this is just—I mean, this is just a corporation valuing money over human life. Yes. Okay. So the NHTSA claimed that between two thousand and three thousand deaths would occur each year due to fire and crashes. Ford dismissed that and said the majority of those crash victims would actually die prior to the fire being a problem, like they would die as the impact itself. So you can't count those deaths. <laughs> and they said it was probably closer to like 600 to 700 actual fire-related deaths a year, which so, is still six, 600 to right. many. Yeah, uh, but so basically they're saying uh, the fire is just making sure the job is complete. In most yes, of yeah. these cases, it's just yeah. just yeah. finishing the job. The job now, the is mostly damning, done, but they're no, gonna finish they're just, it. It's just finish it. Yeah. The, now the damning part of this memo is table three, which again I'm gonna put a link up to this, and there will be a picture if you're if you're watching it on YouTube of it. It, it says that uh, there would be 180 burn deaths, 180 serious burns, and 2,000 burn cars is their prediction for 
what would likely happen in a year. In a year? Placed, in a year. Uh, they placed, <laughs> Johnny, they placed, hold on, this is going to get, this is where you're going to get mad. They placed human life, they valued it at $200,000, which is $1.2 million today, which to be fair, I think is more than what corporations value human uh, life. My now. wife's but, life insurance is less than that. I'm not 1.2 million. Yeah, so they placed human life at 200,000. They placed injury at 67,000 or 414,000 a day. And they placed an estimated $700 per vehicle in cost. So, total, okay, real quick, uh, the injury that they're talking about here uh, is just to be clear, horribly burned. This is yeah. burn victim skin transplant. Like this is yeah. not an this is not a dislocated shoulder or broken arm or yeah, some broken I, ribs. You don't. It's not a. It's not. You don't really recover from it. It's just no. they they fix your skin so it doesn't hurt all the time, but you're mangled yeah. and, and. To be fair, part of these numbers were actually developed by the NHTSA, so you can't entirely blame Ford for their valuation. Oh, I'm not things, blaming. I'm not but, blaming uh, Ford. I'm blaming uh, the 1970s general idea of what it was to be safe. Yeah, uh, and uh, and that's I would I would inverse those numbers. I would say it costs a hell of a lot more money for the burned, injured victim who's going to have to spend the rest of his life getting skin grafts than it would for that you know person who actually died. But yeah, that's. Neither here nor there. So they totaled, they estimated that in a, in a given year, it would cost uh, $49.5 million in damages for the burn victims. Or, you know, the burn crash, the burn accidents, all that stuff. Okay, so, so that's, their, point, that's the basically, oh, oh, that's their that's cost Ford's, if they yeah, had to Ford's pay estimate, out whatever. If they had to just, they didn't change anything and they were just paying out the damages. They said $49.5 million a okay. year or $278.6 million a day. Now, they claimed that it would cost $11 per car and $11 per truck to bring them up to the safety standards in Section 301. Spread out over 11 million cars and 1.5 million trucks, you have $137 million or $848.2 million today, so it would cost approximately $2.5 million or 2.5 times more to fix the problem than just to ignore it and pay out the people. Right. Basi yeah, basically they're saving $100 million by letting people die to buy their product. So... Ford's or get injured. Argument to the NHTSA against making safety standards is it's just cheaper not to. Yeah, and, and <laughs> to hell with the human life. We've not changed. It's cheaper not to. Ford literally we haven't said changed today. To the American people, just let them burn. It's cheaper. <laughs> well, some of them. It's a small percentage, and there, it's a percentage of which they're willing to pay out. I mean, this this happens all the time with law with companies paying uh, lawsuits out. Uh, in in small, they're like, okay, we'll give you. I tell you what, drop this lawsuit. We'll give you. I don't know, eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which is more money than that person would ever dream of ever having. Think of yeah. And, and tell you what. I'm going to settle just about everything if you're going to give me $850,000. But companies do this all the time. Yep. And it's yep. just because it's and cheaper is, to do this that is than just, just to fix the problem. This is the, and... Yeah. This is the big the, – this is the first big public one that becomes public domain that people learn about. Now, this memo – Well, again, it, I mean, the good like, thing is, though, that it's the last one, and we learned from it and started holding companies responsible <laughs> for their actions. Sure. Sure. Yeah, this is uh, this is um, this is also like the, the misinformation about this memo is that people think it's just related to the Ford Pinto. It's not just right. related to the Ford Pinto. It's, it's right. related to all yeah. Ford's vehicles. It's basically related to all vehicles on the road. Ford was trying to say that it's more expensive to fix a problem across the industry than it was to uh, than it to, was to just pay people out to so pay the people pay that people are dying or being injured. <laughs> being severely injured yeah now beginning in 1973 ford's own recall service began receiving reports of rear end collision fires they investigated it twice and found no need for action they're like nah, that's good okay like no more or less dangerous than any other vehicle out there what a what a what a very funny uh choice of words that they found no need for action they didn't find because they can't no problem probably they found just don't need no for need action. for action because that yep. action that they would have had to take was too expensive is basically what they're telling you. Eleven dollars per car, too expensive. Tommy, in 1974, I'm getting, I'm, Tommy, this is going to get bad. I'm, I'm feeling. I know. Like I know. It's bubbling. The NH, uh, the 1974, the NHTSA would also investigate and find Ford Pinto was no more or less dangerous than any other subcompact on the road. So no need for a recall because it's no more or less dangerous than 
the Volkswagen Bug. Okay, is or that the, or the Datsun accurate? Or the Gremlin? W- were all of these tiny cars as dangerous? We will get there at the end, and I'll let you decide okay. for yourself at the very end. So, so, so bear with me. Uh, well, this memo is going to leak, and the Pinto Madness article is going to be published, and it would spur public outcry. And they claim for that Ford. The big issue here in this in this Pinto Madness is that they claim yeah. Ford knew about the problem prior to the car even being sold. And they're like, which, uh, "No, we didn't. We didn't listen to any of the people that brought this to our attention." <laughs> So the <laughs> day after this article, yeah, so the so the day after the article is published, there you know, and the day after there's a public press conference over the article on August 11th, 1977, the NHSTA or the NHTSA initiates another investigation, and this time, this time, they do some crash tests. Uh oh. And I'm gonna go ahead and play. I'm gonna play one of their crash tests. So, uh, so from that crash test, you can clearly see that there might be a, a wee bit of a problem <laughs> with the car just bursting into flames. But Ford was like, uh-uh, uh-uh, listen, mm-mm. that That's test was fine. unfair. No, 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 no. no they, they, they claim the test was unfair. Now, you got to bear with me. This is where you're going to get really mad. They claim it was unfair because instead of a regular barrier crash test, they used a, rear, a real car that's called a bullet car that has a pointed front end. So, not fair. Then, mm. to make it even mm-hmm. more not fair, they filled that front, you know, the, the front end of that car with weight uh, that they claimed was specifically designed to have the car slide up underneath the Pinto to hit the gas tank. Uh, Although, what it was really doing right. was simulating, you know, the weight of a fucking engine yeah, in the car yeah. now yeah it turns out to make engine, all that, engines are heavy it turns yeah, out to make uh to make all of that even worse ford claimed that the headlights were turned on thus encouraging the induction of a spark and that and that the gas tank was filled full of gas and not at the industry standard half gas half non-flammable liquid because yeah that's real life where you're driving around with a half a gas tank full of water and, uh, and finally, they complained that the crash test occurred at 35 miles per hour, not the 25 miles per hour that was the industry standard. Okay. They said that most cars, most subcompact cars would fail at that 35 mile per hour test. Okay, so real quick, just, just a, a brief recap here. We have uh, them saying basically no one's going to drive at night because yep. the headlights can't be on in this, in this crash test. They're saying... Uh, that if a car has an engine in the front, basically if you're not being uh, rear-ended by a you know rear engine Porsche or Ferrari or whatever, yeah, you're only uh, being rear-ended by rear end engine cars. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, okay, so that's fine. You're you're good there as long as you're driving in the daylight and are being rear-ended by by sports cars. Um, and then the the what was the, that that last little? The, it had a point. A the, pointed the pointed. Hood, which, okay. Uh, by the way, in 1970, find me a sedan that doesn't have some kind of point to the hood of the car. Oh yeah, like every every car from the 70s, as far as I know, at least watching the Jetsons, because that's my only knowledge of the 70s, is they had uh, <laughs> two big spikes on the sides and then one big spike in the middle, and that was yeah. the, that was what all of the cars looked like. Um, but okay, how are how how are, how are they going to be mad about them they're setting up that real the, life scenarios and crashing exactly? Against that's it. what I was going to say. They're they're complaining that the NHSTA or TSA, whatever the hell it is, it, it did a real life crash test on the car. Yeah, not just and having it, the car get hit by a barrier. Did a real life crash test of the car, and they're like, "What? Uh uh-uh, uh, that." How dare you test a real life scenario? Yeah, guys, we did just enough in the lab scenarios to pass this test. How dare you bring us a real life scenario that we now have to pass? That's insane. Like, wh- in what situation are people going to run across uh, cars driving at night, rear ending them? And their final argument is like, well, all the other cars are going to fail too, so come on, it's not fair. So they're wanting a so the, curve set for the safety of people. 
The NHTSA also found that 27 deaths were directly related to the rear impact fire of Ford Pintos between 1971 and 1977. How many? So not sorry, a lot of deaths. Many? 27. So not a okay. lot, but still, you know. So it's only 27 people that got trapped in their car and burnt alive on and account of death. their yes. laziness and unwillingness to adhere to safety standards. Yes. All right, uh, so Ford that's a number we're willing to accept, I think, as Americans. I think we're good with that, yeah. generally. Yep, so the NHTSA would tell Ford, hey, um, yeah, you guys failed. you got to fix this. <laughs> Ford did voluntarily recall uh, all the poor Ford Pintos on June 9th, 1978, days before the NHTSA uh, finding was made public. So they're trying to save all face of at them? this point. They're like, yeah, they're like, we'll take them all back and fix them if you if you want. Which, of course, you know, in most – like how many people actually in automotive like recalls are like, yeah, okay, take the car. I guarantee okay. you the Ford Pintos that my brother and dad were driving were not fixed. Well, here's a th here's a thing about that. Um, today with email and with all the tracking and, and, and the keeping track of everything they do, uh, it's hard to find out about a recall. Like and you, well, Johnny, you find it on Facebook, or you get maybe you're lucky and you actually like registered your car on, uh, you know, Honda or Ford or whatever dot com, and and they're gonna email you about any 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 recalls they have. But for the most part, they just kind of put one out, and unless you happen to check the news and see it, you're hopefully. out of luck. Yeah. Well. So this would lead to lawsuits. Ford would be sued 117 times over the Ford Pinto, but two cases stick out. I'm going to go over those two cases okay. real quick, real briefly. So the first one is Grimshaw versus Ford Motor Company, and this is a very definitive one that most people reference when they're talking about this whole shindig. Okay. So this was decided in 1978, uh, I, I believe right around the time that like Ford was like, yeah, we fucked up. <laughs> so Okay, so 1978, you said the, the Pinto was uh, until 79 or 80. So this is was this the nail in the coffin? Uh, it's, it's, it, it doesn't help. And it revolves around a fatally severe burning, um, a fatally severe uh, burning and a fatality. So we've got two, uh, we got a burn person who almost died and a person died. You know what so the problem for Ford Gray, is there? The, their their biggest problem there? The survivor. Yeah. yeah. So Lily Gray, uh, she was driving her 1972 Ford Pinto in the center lane of a California highway with her 13-year-old passenger, Richard Grimshaw, when the transmission took a shit. And the Pinto stalled, resulting in her being rear-ended by a vehicle behind her going between 30 and 50 miles per hour at the impact. It's kind of estimated. The, because the, the speed limit was 50. It was then, breaking when it hit. Right. Uh, and, yeah. so, and so, okay, so this is, she's just driving down the hallway, uh, down the highway in her car. And the car stops. Stops. Yep. And she gets rear-ended because it stalled. Uh, the uh, the doors jam, the car catches on fire, and Lily Gray dies on the scene while Richard is uh, severely burned and would spend the rest of his life getting skin grafts uh, because he's severely burned. Oh, like and getting, also... Specifically, I think it was his ear. Like, he had to keep getting his ear rebuilt. Yeah. Also, uh, that small little detail of uh, his mother burning to death beside him, trapped in this car. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm guessing that probably didn't stay with him too long mentally, uh, he probably got over it pretty quickly, but, uh, you know, for some people yeah. that might stick with them. Now, this is all, uh, in conjunction with the, uh, the, the Pinto madness, uh, mother Jones article came oh, out specifically uh -huh. okay. right before this. They intentionally did it to spur public outrage against, you uh, know, okay. Ford. All right. Yeah. Spur During public outrage or, um, uh, find an opportunity to get the public to care is another way. Well, yeah, uh, that's exactly yeah. Um, that's exactly what it is. The jury found Ford at fault and set a record verdict of one hundred twenty-seven point eight million dollar uh, fine, or seven hundred ninety-one point two today in total damages. One hundred twenty-five million were punitive, and two point eight four one million went to Richard Grimshaw, and six hundred sixty-five thousand went to the family of Lily Gray. Now, if you're not from America, we have a cap on what you can personally collect from a lawsuit. That doesn't re re reflect. Punitive damages from America. So didn't know essentially, that. so essentially, what you have is like if you get injured, there is a cap on what you can sue, and I think in most states it's around three million dollars. Okay, you can still get so anything over that is punitive, 
and goes to the state because, you know, taxes. So punitive Johnny, damages get... are just is just money going to uh, uh, to underpay teachers. <laughs> sure. Is it basically? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that's where it goes, Johnny. <laughs> the judge. Uh, this is where you're going to get really mad, Johnny. Uh, oh, the judge it. is going to reduce. He's going to reduce the punitive damages to $3.5 million because, after all, and I quote, that was still larger than any other punitive damage award in the state by a factor of about five. So he takes the record $125 million punitive and just lets Ford off the hook so for everything. Good enough because it's bigger than ever. Yes. Now, the second case, Johnny, is Indiana versus a Ford Motor Company. Indiana! Home state, ba, 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 let's ba, go! Ba, 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 ba. Home yeah. state! Uh, this case is centered around an accident that occurred on August 10th, uh -huh. 1978, where three teenage girls are driving their Ford Pinto that Daddy bought them, and they're, they're in a... Okay, oh, hold on. Wait, all right. Oh, 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 you said that a little bit, like Daddy bought them, like they bought, him, they bought them a BMW or Mercedes. Daddy bought him a Pinto. All right, I'm sorry. Daddy bought him a Pinto, so Daddy, Daddy must not have loved him enough. Yeah. So this is really Daddy hated Daddy's these fault. little girls and wanted to give them something crappy to learn how to drive on. So he provided them with a Pinto. Yeah. So the teenage driver, she, uh, uh, I'm not, it, it, I'm not making any stereotypes here or anything like that. This is back in the day where the gas caps weren't attached to the vehicle. Like you would take them off and you would have to, you know, usually oh, right, right. To okay. fill up. Totally then you have to replace bit, them. Yeah. Well, she forgot to do that. Yep. And so as she drove off, she, it fell off. Okay. So she stopped the vehicle to sure. go collect said, been there and then was getting back in the car and then Chevy van. On the side of the, I, I assume she pulled over on the side yeah. of the road and then got. I would assume, but they, yeah, I would assume, but they got rear-ended by a Chevy van and all three of them died. Oh, jeez! How to make what? How fast was this? How fast was the van going? Yeah, do we know? Uh, I, I didn't, I didn't no. have that information. Fast now the. Uh, Fast enough. Well, all you had to do was go above 20 20, miles 23 an miles an hour. Apparently. <laughs> there's, a, there's a risk that the car would explode. Now, the Erlachs, Daddy Erlach, would receive a, a recall notice for that very Ford Pinto in 1979. Uh, can you can you imagine? Well, this this naturally got him a little peeved. You so don't he went to, say. He went to the Elkhart County prosecutor, and he agreed and brought up charges on Ford on three counts of reckless homicide, the first time that a corporation was ever brought up on charges yes. of homicide. There we go. Okay, we're getting grand somewhere jury, now. Grand jury indicts on three charges of reckless homicide. Now, this is where you're going to get pissed off again. Because it's a corporation, and it's a person. Right, a corporation. But you can't actually, you can't actually arrest a corporation because it's a building so no, how but do you arrest people. a building uh i don't know the ceos the coo the cf no 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 the owner it is determined that the it is determined that the, the max, shareholders yeah johnny wait it's determined that the max punishment is thirty thousand dollars i'm sorry come again yep the max they, punishment I, I, for okay so for, for a course. corporation committing reckless homicide Three time, times times three, is it thirty thousand yeah. dollars per reckless homicide? I think it's a max of thirty thousand dollars for just not a, a corpor a corporation yes. making millions of dollars a year. Yes. Okay, so that would be the and this is basically the equivalent of me uh, committing reckless homicide. Going to court and the court being like, you know what? It's gonna be thirty thirty bucks since. You don't know how little I make, Tom. It's gonna be thirty <laughs> yeah, cents. Forgot, yeah. Thirty cents. <laughs> yeah. To cover. I'll pay thirty now, bucks um, too. By the way, I could do that. I can Ford, swing it. But Ford God, has already lost. 
yeah, Ford has already lost the big the big uh, Grimshaw versus Ford case, so they didn't want to lose a second time because their reputation's at stake. And there's a lot to be said. Like if they lost, corporations could be held accountable for their actions, which would be awful. We can't have that. Also, uh, no, we can't have that. really, can we can we back back up real quick? The only thing they care about is how they look after them after the fact. Well, yeah. Uh, so they spend. In order to get out of a thirty thousand dollar fine, they hire a legal team and spend one million dollars yeah. fighting this. Yeah, no doubt, absolutely. Now the that's the nothing prosecutors, to them. Yeah, nothing. The prosecutors, the prosecutors' budget for this trial is twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. See, this is why corporations are such a problem, because all they do is just throw so much more money at anything. That could hurt their reputation, then they are willing to to fix any issues they may have. This yep. is true so across the, uh, the board. Across the board, yep. So the jury has instructed very confusing and strict guidelines about what it would take to convict Ford of reckless homicide. So a lot of that has to go that they have to physically prove that they knew about it. They've got to go through all these hoops and bounds mm-hmm. and all this other stuff. So after months and months of trials, days of deliberation, the jury comes back and says, we're hung. Like we're like, we can't, we can't make this. The judge says, not in Elkhart, Indiana, not in my home County. You're not going to do that. You're going to go back and come up with a decision, not on a case that's this, mm-hmm. that's this important come back with a decision jury comes back and says hey look can you, you would you take a simple majority is that good enough no it's got to be a you know it's got to be unanimous and now, so long story now, did, short did, did this did this jury do they have um access to ford's like emails records that, or anything like the, probably the not, memo right? like I, yeah uh well the memo i believe was in the uh was in the uh trial Right, the middle, but, um, but but I'm talking about like if they're going to try to prove that people knew about things and and everything else. Oh, you know, you know, they, Ford's team got most of that shit thrown. Right, out. No. I, that's what I'm saying. So like, the problem they're not able to go into the investigation like the FBI would in in yeah. find. The problem is the judge can find like a very specific like it had to meet this exact parameter, and people were having problems with the language. So long story sure, short, Ford course. wins. So the so the uh, so they don't. <laughs> So the only fees they pay are to their lawyers. They pay the one million dollar fee to the lawyer. So all these sad saps who died or had family members died. Nothing. Well, no, 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 no. They pay out a crap ton of settlements. They settle a lot of stuff. They were sued one hundred seventeen okay. times. They one hundred and seventeen times. They 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 pay out a lot of those. They did have to pay the three point five million dollars and punitive damages, and then, of course, the uh, the $2.84 million to Richard Grimshaw and the $665,000 to the family of Lily yeah. Gray. They did have to pay that. So they did lose money, but it's it's pennies in a bucket that they don't care well, about. Well, no, Tom. I mean, everybody knows that this absolutely ruined Ford as a company. That's why you don't see Fords anymore. Yeah, they don't, yeah, they don't exist anymore. Yeah, right? So, um, so, obviously, Ford got rid of the Pinto because you can't ever repair the reputation <laughs> of the Ford Pinto <laughs> After this, even if you fix the problem, people are going to be like, it's a death trap. Don't so, get in it. So they rebranded it, like rebadged the Focus or? <laughs> well, the Escort, I think, probably. Was it the Escort, so, like a uh, mid-range, though? Wasn't that like the No, Escort? it was a hatchback. It was a, no, it was, it was a hatchback. Oh, Escort was the, the Civic. Escort was a hatchback. Well, yeah, they had Honda, you had the hatchback, so I... or you well you had the you had the hatchback, or you had the uh, or you had the uh, the 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 wagon, the um, station wagon. Okay. Uh, I had a buddy in high school. He drove the station wagon, and me and another buddy drove the uh, hatchbacks. We we there were three of us that were all cruising around in our Ford Escorts. Yeah. See, I uh, I was a Honda guy, so I, I did the Civic, and the, and then my dad had well, like a Accord. You or remember my. Uh, you remember oh, my yeah. teal escort, yeah. don't you? Yeah, oh yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah, it was I fantastic. It. I loved that little guy. He, yeah. was, he was he was glorious. Yeah. Uh, now um, they have done studies since this that have looked at crash tests over the entire period of time. Uh, the Ford Pinto was one point nine percent of all cars on the road, which is actually kind of a lot in America. At one point in time, one point nine percent of all cars on the road were Ford Pinto. So that's you know. I mean, you see that, but like. I- it doesn't seem that high to me because well, I guess it depends how many types of cars were there. How many, uh, because if you have 300 different types of 
make model not much no i'm sure there's weight much, yeah you gotta back then i'm sure it well, was less and so that that might well, be significant but right now so, i would say one percent of cars would be on the low side but i know nothing so who knows uh, yeah well in any case um it, they found out that in recent studies that it was on par with safety standards of the uh, of the Gremlin, which isn't saying much. The Chevy Vega, which is also not saying much. The Datsun 510, which is also not. These are all much. cars that failed because of how dangerous that they were, were, right? Garbage. <laughs> and the Volkswagen Bug that has its reputation for being a serial killer's car of choice. It's a death so, trap. You know. Yay! The numbers showed that in fire-related crashes, the Ford Pinto performed average to slightly below average. On other accidents, the Ford Pinto <laughs> rated average to even slightly above average. And so all Ford, right. even up to this day, would say it was all a witch hunt. There was never a problem with the car. It was just people panicking over nothing. But what they forget to tell you is that even studies today found that the Ford Pinto in rear-end collisions, what we claim was the problem... Mm-hmm. Below average. <laughs> yeah, but they were looking at any collision. They were looking at all the total collisions. So they maybe were like, they were in, slightly look at, safer from uh, the front right quarter panel collision because the gas tank was in the back, or any front collisions because the gas tank's yeah. in the back. They may, they were slightly yeah. safer there. Um, yeah, Ford's defense is all the other cars were shit too, so... And then it averages out. Yeah, so it's fine. <laughs> So I'll let you at home decide whether or not Ford Pinto should have this reputation or not. I will tell you that both my dad and my brother's Ford Pinto never caught on fire. How many times did they get rear-ended? Ford, uh, never. Because uh, that's the thing. It's not, it's, not a, it's, not a, well, it's not a case of spontaneous combustion, Tommy. It's a case of a if rear I get rear-ended, which I've been rear-ended like seven times. I never died. Not once. Uh, I think that's gonna that's gonna be a quote on a shirt there, Johnny. I've been around it seven times, uh, but the uh, my dad's Ford Pinto just blew like the like the it didn't blow up on fire. It just the engine blew out. Uh, now my brother's Ford Pinto, uh, we used we kept my dad's Ford Pinto to keep my brother's Ford Pinto running, and it finally died when he hit an owl head on, and it went into the front grill Ooh. and and it hit the radiator fan, and that fan just chewed up the shit out of the engine. Mm. So yeah, and well, the owl feathers killed. And <laughs> beak yeah, and an owl everything. killed my brother's Ford Pinto. So. That's it for this week in Historic Hindsight. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review. And join us next week when we talk about Waco!